Good morning. Happy 4th of July weekend. I have two special guests today. It's Joe with Acapella Podcast. We're talking about group homes today, um, otherwise known as, known as residential care homes. So we have two of the best and experts in residential care homes. I've got Brian Levy. He is on the management team at Manchester Place. He's also um, with Cambridge Caregivers. And then I also have Chris Klein, who is with Senior Living Specialist. It's one of the top placement services in Dallas. She is one of, on the executive team. Um, Combo, we have a great team today. And what I love about my guests today is they truly care about the best interest of our DFW seniors. So we're talking today about group homes. So let's start right away. Brian, tell me about Manchester Place. So much to tell. Uh, Manchester Place started um, 11 years ago. We have four boutique assisted living care homes that are custom purpose built. So a lot of homes in Dallas have been converted with Jack and Jill bathrooms. We built our homes from ground up. So the homes actually look like just a mansion in a neighborhood, but when you get inside, there's eight private suites with bedroom bathroom attached. So eight master bedrooms in a big house. Mm -hmm. um, two full-time CNA caregivers on duty 24-7. So it's a 24-hour operation. And you do have new nurse supervision. We have a nurse on staff, we have a doctor on staff, and we have a director of life enrichment on staff who does one-on-one -on -one activities with the residents. And that's wonderful. That's something that is very unique and a great selling point. And I have been to your homes many times, and they are incredible. The care is wonderful. Um, I also have Chris Klein, and Chris is, you work with... Uh, Manchester Place, you are placing um, clients that are interested in group homes, assisted livings. So tell me, let's talk just when you're looking for a group home, um, tell me how you fit in. How do you guys work together? Well, a lot of times um, when a loved one is being discharged from the hospital, from rehab, or a family has been searching online and they're trying to find help. They're trying to find answers. So they come to us or they get referred to us as senior living specialists. And we do a full discovery with the family to really work with them and develop a relationship to help determine their best needs based on care, based on geographic location and budget. And of course we work with Manchester Place. They're one of our top homes. It's an incredible organization. I've been in the homes. They're beautiful. I've seen the ensuite bathrooms and it's just, it's a really, really great group to work with. So when we are helping the family since our team has been in the communities and been in these homes, we can paint that picture with them and really get them um, to trust the process. Um, so it's we do have a really strong relationship with all of the partners that we have across the Metroplex. Well, I wanna talk about, I know people have their loved ones that they need to find care for them. They cannot either, they cannot afford round the clock care or they just can't do it. They've got adult children, they've got their parents, um, and they, it's that sandwich generation. And, you know, I have this conversation so many times. Nobody says, when I turn 80, if I have dementia, please put <laughs> right. me in a nursing home. Right. I think I've done that by yeah. now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got that plan in place. So, yeah, so you want to have the conversation what nobody wants to go to a nursing home. Let's right. face it, nobody does. We all have that image of the nursing home. I, I was a candy striper when I was in high school. Wow. And um, it, at church, you know, my family, um, we would go visit nursing homes on Sundays. And so I, I always had this. I'll bet half your audience doesn't know what a candy striper is. Yeah, I, I, love, the candy I love that they have uh, I out, too, your, yeah. your uniform is up in the office. Oh, yeah, really? we do. And I yeah. learned a lot just really young sure. about the importance of just being there and yeah. being present and listening and mm -hmm. talking and singing. And um, I loved being a candy striper, but, um, but anyway, um, looking for a group home. And I want to use my own example. Um, I shared with you guys, my dad uh, was 86, never saved a dime. I'm very open about my situation with my dad, wonderful guy, but just never good with money. Um, we were in a situation we had to put him somewhere fast. He was at my house for, for three weeks, ordered me around like I was 
12 years old I was the help <laughs> and then went to my sisters and within three days she's like I cannot do that this he'd wake us up all hours of the night got a day his days and nights mixed up uh, wanted a glass of wine at two in the morning can't get this bottle open on and on so we found uh, we were pressed we siblings all put money in together and needed to find something. So it was a social worker that recommended this group home to us. We moved my dad in. It looked great on the surface, on the outside. People were pleasant. Um, it was not licensed, but it was supposedly, you know, I, we got a good rep recommendation from a social worker. So I assume it's gonna be okay. Um, next thing we know, uh, they have sold my father's social security number. Uh, he is, doctors are being charged. He's been put on hospice and not appropriate for hospice. Um, the list goes on and on. So uh, looking back, and here I am, a healthcare professional, and I was duped. My sister's a healthcare professional. She's mm -hmm. an RN. So just having the value in hindsight, had I worked with senior living specialist had i made calls to you brian and said you know what i would love my dad to be at manchester place but we just can't afford that what who would you recommend so <laughs> right yeah so, had, so many resources available there, that you shouldn't go in blind anywhere no I mean, so, and yeah. i did and i just assumed so i'm i'm one that you know i'm preaching to the choir we should have done our homework even right. if it meant you know, dad is discharging from the hospital. You got two days and you got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So tell me, Chris, I know they're licensed group homes like Manchester Place. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of licensed, but they're also unlicensed. And how, how, do, what is the criteria unlicensed versus licensed? And I know there are some good unlicensed group homes. If we can talk about that. Your unlicensed homes across the Metroplex, I'd say there's an estimated 35% roughly, that are potentially unlicensed, maybe they're, that's their future goal, um, or they're in the process of it. Some of them, that is not their goal, so they care for three people. I think there's a, a state limitation on the amount of people that they can care for, or with you know some of the um, housing ordinances. You know, there's there's a limitation to that. But a lot of the ones that we work with, um, you know, we'll go, we tour them, we vet them. Um, we also we work so closely with the families that their feedback is crucial. Mm -hmm. So we have the penalty box, and if someone is not you know, providing the appropriate care if a family's having issues, then um, then we won't work with them. So we're we're very careful with it. And to to the social worker that had referred the home to you, they're really limited. Their caseload and everything is so heavy that it's not really their fault. So we work really mm -hmm. hard to keep those relationships with the social workers so that they know that they can rely on us and trust us. And we have two full-time social workers as well on our team. Um, so we really try to take the most ethical approach to do the best thing for the family based on their needs. And licensed or unlicensed, um, the licensed ones are amazing. They can still mess up, no one's perfect, um, but the licensed homes are great for long-term care insurance policies and for really following all those state regulations like the larger communities. You know, We definitely try to stick with them um, whenever possible. They vet their clients so thoroughly that by the time they get to us it's almost an automatic move in they know their care plan they know their budget they know our skill set and they know the needs of this prospect and they know exactly where they need to be and so what do you do like you've got say uh someone has a patient or their mother is on hospice but they just cannot take care of her anymore at home. It's just too exhausting. So do you accept r residents that are on hospice? We do, and I'll tell you, probably 50% of our residents currently are on hospice. Um, you know, there's different criteria mm -hmm. for hospice, and we actually have residents that go off of hospice. Mm -hmm. um, we are not, by, by any stretch of the imagination, respite care, mm -hmm. uh, but we do cater to very high acuity residents that have very, very high, high, high care needs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a triplegic resident, we have nonverbal residents, um, very high care needs. So let me ask you this. So 
I know you have these homes. You've had y'all have had them for a long time. What is the longest time length of stay you've had with a resident? Wow, <laughs> great question. Um, I don't even know if I can. I shouldn't say her name. She was so sweet. She um, she was with us about ten years. Wow. Yeah, and we still have our first employee, Erin, who's director of life enrichment, was our first. So she's been there 11 years now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so this one particular lady, she lived in, um, in our Spring Valley location from the beginning. And she was, she was, she was a staple. <laughs> she was the mayor. Well, you know, when yeah. I was a hospice nurse many years ago, there were only a few group homes that I knew of. And I always thought, oh, I want to do this. I, I would love to have a residential care home. I tried it. You know, I love private duty. It's my thing. But re group homes are hard. I often have people say, oh, my gosh, that's so cool. My friends in San Antonio, I want to open one of these. Mm -hmm. What's your best advice? I'm like, don't do it. I know. Don't do it. Um, on a personal note, you're asking about residents. My grandmother was one of the first residents at Manchester. Well. Before I knew the owners, um, our kids are friends. That's kind of how we know each other. But my grandmother, I, I mean, for four years... I spent a lot of time in that house at St. Michael's. So let me ask you, how are you handling COVID and family members wanting to see their loved ones? Is this on? <laughs> <laughs> Where do I begin? Go ahead. You start first. Oh, goodness. That's the million dollar question. Yeah. Can we tour? Can we go see them? And we're finding, you know, we work with we work with everyone. We love the big communities. They're great partners with us. Um, it has seemed lately, and I went back and looked at some of the families that I've helped over the last few months, just myself, and there's been quite a trend with working with more of the residential care home settings um, due to the ability to for the infection control procedures. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone has their protocols and the state has also, you know, and the CDC guidelines have also given mandates for those licensed facilities as well. Um, but the great thing is that those smaller environments have been able to really do a good, an outstanding job um, on infection control and work really closely and customize all of the interaction with the families. It's been quite a blessing. Mm -hmm. Knock on wood, COVID free. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Newcomer, our staff doctor and um, our staff uh, director of nursing, uh, Cindy Greenberg, have locked up our homes. They won't let the owners in. They won't let me in. No vendors, no hospice, no home health. They're mm -hmm. doing it all. Wow. So um, kudos to them. Cindy that is, is round the clock. I mean, she's done everything from comfort care, doing teledoc with hospice companies to end of life to doing it all. Wow. It's remarkable. Wow, that's um, but you know, you got to scramble and, and, mm -hmm. and it hit fast, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but um, like, like Chris said, we're not doing tours right now. You know I mean? That's kind of what the internet's for. So um, Sandy was at one of the houses the other day and I get, and she did a FaceTime tour with the family, mm -hmm. um, which isn't uncommon because we have families that live not just out of state, but out of country. So we're used to dealing with families on a technical basis in terms of FaceTime and stuff. This is just a different level. So you we, are moving people in right now. As of what's today, two weeks ago yesterday, we just started entertaining the idea of um, case by case basis. I mean, the criteria is real high, but yes, we will we will um, consider move-ins right now. Well, and that's where we work together because Cambridge caregivers. I know Brian, you and I have been friends, and when I have a question on a regulation or just something going on in the community, or I can't staff or. Uh, you're a great resource. But that's the beauty of this community. And mm -hmm. it is a business, but at the end of the day, it's a community. Mm -hmm. And when you can work that closely with friendly competitors, mm -hmm. which I'm um, friends with other care home owners, other PAS company owners, I mean, this is, it's a big city, but it's a small world. And well, when you're so focused on the families and the care, it doesn't, you know, it, does, it, it doesn't, it crosses over so fluidly that it, it doesn't really... It doesn't matter. It's about them. We, yeah. And quite frankly, we stay full so often that we have wait lists where I can refer people to other homes or just straight back to Chris to say, this is an amazing family. They need some guidance. Well, and I feel like, you know, the old, if you build it, they will come. You know, if you provide the right care, yeah. you're going to get referrals. It's, it's word of mouth. But if you do the right thing, and we have a lot of patients right now leaving the hospital they don't want to go to rehab they want to go home so we're getting a big demand for private nurses and um, 
that's a good alternative is private caregivers like Cambridge, Acapella, um, while we're in that transition. It is in its transition, and I can't tell you how many how many calls I get a day from people, you know, converting their living room or their dining room into mom's room for a month, or somebody rented a condo the other day for us to have caregivers go in that condo with mom wow. in between. So people are getting creative, mm -hmm. and you know, fortunately, some people have more money than others, mm -hmm. and so they can do those things. Mm -hmm. um, um, but there is this discharge, um, now what feeling of um, mom's coming home, where is she going? Mm -hmm. So we're just very, very cautious. Well, and we just have to be adaptable too. You know, nobody planned for COVID to hit. Right. Nobody planned for a pandemic. And I will say, you know, hats off to the senior community. Yes. You guys, you know, we're all doing the best we can. And working hard and uh it's really about those seniors and keeping them healthy For, absolutely and there's no playbook mm -hmm. i mean no one said oh turn to chapter 17 this is where this fits no. in we're you know we're making it up as we go and i'm fortunate that we have a doctor on staff who's on staff at ut southwestern and their their plans are very thorough so we're well, up to date on all of the the do's and don'ts okay and i want to get back to license versus non-licensed mm -hmm. and in private duty we have surveyors and we have somebody that may just show up in our office they say give us a list of patients and that's so it's such a nice term we call them auditors <laughs> <laughs> you call them what you want but here's our no, file cabinet yeah, I so call them, sir, i'm a nurse They're yes a exactly no this uh, that's an audit so do group homes have those auditors or oh. surveyors do they just show up at the door or do they make an appointment an appointment. I'm so sure you're kidding. This is the appointment. It's yeah. fire marshal. It's a budsman's. It's uh, we have a whole list of checks and balances. Yeah. Okay. So with with your larger homes, with your higher census, um, I know there was something I learned when I was interested in, in a group home was making sure you could get everybody out. Uh, yeah, an evacuation plan. Yeah, kind of so, like the fire drill at schools. Exactly. So what do you do? Not just. I mean, do you have a plan? If there's a fire, you can get your residents out. So our St. Michael's location, three doors down, is gone from the tornado. So imagine wow. yeah, three doors. Um, so we are type B small is what our license is, is under, type B small. And um, I you know, didn't know this until you know it, but that means the residents cannot self-evacuate. Hence, two full-time on-duty, 24-7 mm -hmm. awake. Mm -hmm. Some care homes have one on duty at night or one on duty at night asleep just in case. I mean, you know, every, everybody does it differently. Mm -hmm. I know ours are awake, and that's the, one of the main purposes. Yeah, because you want to be able to get them out. Well, in the tornado, we had a patient, a private duty patient, that passed away. Um, he was right in that area in his own home, passed away, funeral home came, family left. An hour later, his house was demolished demolished completely right at Royal and Preston area. It was yeah. very scary. We were so fortunate that we did lives were not spared, yeah. you know, yeah. no, a we, lot of destruction. Knock on wood. I mean, we're so fortunate and we're also fortunate. All of our homes have backup generators. Yeah. So we're right. the only one in that neighborhood with power for a long, long time. So, okay, we're going to go to Chris. So Chris, you've got a family that has very little resources. Mm -hmm. They say, Chris, my dad has fifteen hundred a month for through Social Security. I'm gonna pitch in five hundred a month. Can you help me find a safe place that you would send your loved one? What do you, What do you say to that? You know, we can. Uh, we work with a lot of that because a lot of people haven't saved, and a lot of the baby boomers coming up, they they spent. It was a different mentality. So there's a huge population that doesn't have the resources. And now they're looking at, this is my social security income. I'm coming out of rehab. And I was just told I, I can't live alone. Um, so we do have several options. They're not always, say, in the metro Dallas area, right. um, but they're in the surrounding areas. Um, but we do have several options that are even kind of starting under 2000, but you get 24 seven care medication management, you know, we can get them to a quality, 
a quality home to get good care, and that would keep them out of having to go into a Medicaid potential bed in a nursing home if they were to qualify for that medically. Because right. mm -hmm. they also have to meet medical necessity for that, and not everyone does. Mm -hmm. um, so educating the families on what's available in that crunch time, that crisis time, um, is is really important on our end so that they feel comfortable with the direction that we're able to send well, them. Well, and, and clarify too, Medicare does not pay for custodial care. It does not pay for a group home. <laughs> no. It does not pay for assisted living. And Joe, there is, I was looking, um, you know, we contract with more options than any other placement firm does around the Metroplex. And I was looking in our system at less than 5% of the private care homes are Medicaid accessible, that they'll accept wow. it, less than 5%. So when telling a family, a lot of them, it's their first rodeo, it's their first experience, their heads are exploding with information, and they thought that, well, they have Medicare, or they have Medicaid, um, that's gonna pay for it, right? There's insurance. Right. So telling them that, no, living, that's living expense, and that living expense isn't gonna get paid for by insurance, unless you have a long-term care policy. Mm. Um, so educating them on that in that sticker shock and kind of going through, I mean, the, the options are limited and Medicare doesn't pay for, for living. You mentioned long-term care policy. We have a resident who's been with us over well over a year now and the son and they've been you know the son recently found their long-term care insurance policy oh, and they're wow. gonna back pay him for oh that's so, great so you know it is not uncommon for a spouse to not even know that the other spouse purchased it and kept it in a drawer wow so found money if everybody had those right. policies it would be long-term care insurance world. is like found money and mm -hmm. when it works it works mm -hmm. but you've got it it's almost like you need a manager just to stay on it you know what it's like working with them mm -hmm. and it would have to be licensed mm -hmm. so the long-term oh, yeah, care the, policy the, the some home of has the, to be yeah they're, some of the their older credentials they policies. actually say nursing home they do yeah the the, the language is so old there wasn't mm -hmm. a care home back in 1940 or whatever that yeah, yeah the policies are really written and and it's a little bit of elder abuse when the elder person tries to go claim and, and, and it's like the fax machine goes straight to the trash can. It's a full-time job just mm -hmm. to stay on and get Oh, it is, but they have to because of the fraud. They, it has to be legit yeah. when they're paying out those claims. Yeah. Okay, so this is a question that I have um, because we've had resident clients that can't afford private duty anymore and so they want to go to a group home, but they are super difficult. So seems to be our specialty. The family? Good the question. Client. Great question. <laughs> and family. Yeah. So what do you do if it's a client that is such a nightmare? And I'm talking calls, caregivers' names, insulting, combative. You know, what do you do about that client? Is there are there some that you just can't help or? Just honestly, what what is a family member to do if their dad is just a nightmare? I mean, it would just get say a, it. a noticeable amount of those situations, mm -hmm. and working with the family, I've had families not share those details, and their loved one gets moved right back out because they're not a fit. But when they do share those details, then we have the ability to be upfront with the homes that we're working with and say, before we send their information and get that going, can this be a fit for your clients and your families that are in that house? For the other families that you're working with, this is what we're looking at. We, we have to have those really difficult conversations upfront. And we do try to dig to get as much of that information as possible. There are options and there are um, communities and there are care homes that are more geared towards some behaviors. special behavior needs. Yeah. Some of them are all male or all female with all male or all female you know, gender um, care staff as well. So we have a variety of options. Um, there's, there's usually something that we've got. Um, it might not always be five minutes down the road, though. Mm -hmm. There are options. And so, Brian, have you ever had people that you've had to say, <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is some not horror stories. Right, I know. <laughs> Talk to my lawyer. Um, I, well, Chris, and it's funny. Chris and I were just talking about this earlier. You vet the families as much as you do the prospect. Most definitely. And, you know, half the battle 
is just working with families. There are a lot of helicopter kids, and we know they love their parents, and we love their parents too. But, you know, just because the drawer was left open or we forgot to brush mom's hair, it doesn't mean we don't love her and don't care about her. But just because you saw that on the camera once, it's not a common thing. Um, but we, we try to vet the families. Um, you know, sometimes I've had cases where um, residents will move in not knowing that they have behavior issues. And Kelly, Dr. Newcomer, is great with medication and knowing whether it's a, a UTI or their meds just need to be adjusted. We are not big medicators. We don't want zombies no, just sleeping on the couch. Definitely. But sometimes, you know, when they get out of a rehab or a hospital or another AL or an IL, whatever, the meds aren't even right. They haven't seen a doctor in so long. And so we work with, I mean, you know, having eight residents in each home, we have the ability to slow down and deal with each family one-on-one. -on -one. We do a lot of care plan meetings, like every couple of months as care plans change. Um, but yes, families and residents. I know, yes. it's a it's a, a dual thing, yes. us too. And you know, we, we try to explain, sometimes I'll say to families that we just cannot meet their needs. And I'll just say, you know what, I am so very sorry, but I don't think acapella is the right fit for you. And like us, we are guests in people's homes, but people are guests in your homes too. And so- You would think they would be, you know, some families would be a little bit more appreciative and, you know, wanting to give, 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 and thank you so much and thank you so much, but you know, they're losing control and, you know, we meet them where they are, mm -hmm. you know. I know. So we have had in, in the history of Manchester, we have um, had to evict one resident and it was heartbreaking because this gentleman was, I'm telling you, he was, he was a good man, mm -hmm. but the family impeded our ability to care mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. So it became a, you know, a, a license issue where we just, we couldn't, couldn't do it. We tried and tried and tried. Uh, we didn't just evict him immediately, but it got to that point, and it was sad, and we all cried, but we still have to do our job. Mm -hmm. so, I know. Yeah. Well, thank you. So if people want to get have information, Chris, how can we reach you? Um, well, my I'm pretty visible, but the Senior Living um, Specialist website, so seniorlivingspecialist.com, has an About tab, and our whole team is on there, so you can read the bios of social workers, all of our contact information. Um, my cell phone is 972 five five one nine three six nine mm -hmm. um so text call um we're pretty easy to find um and i know that you know we've always been a big supporter of care homes i know that our owner and founder um uh, paul markowitz mm -hmm. when he founded the company 12 years ago for his own mother um actually she lived in one of the care homes that we work with in dallas for the last few years of her life so we're big supporters um, as well, um, along with all of our big community partners too, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's, but yeah. it's sometimes it's just the right fit to be in a home. So, exactly. And it's the best fit. Yeah. And Brian, how can we reach you if we want more information on Chris and I, are t we're probably the most accessible people <laughs> in the industry. We're 24 <laughs> seven, so uh, you're right, exactly. Um, our website, manchesterliving.com. I'm always available 24 seven on my cell phone, 214-649-9922. Well, in fact, when I called you about being a guest, you always answer on the first ring. I so feel it's, so honored. <laughs> it's in it's, his hand. You should be. It, it is, it's kind of a joke. People say I return texts before they hit send. Yeah. <laughs> but my phone is it's always on me. But and you know what? Well, we're like an ER. We're always open because we're well, there always needs. The people that call us are typically ki adult kids of elder people, right? Well, when are they available to deal with their parents? Nights and weekends. I mean, we have pictures of each other. Or 7 a.m. Or, or 7 a.m. <laughs> on, on, a, on a boat with a fishing rod and a phone or a mountaintop. <laughs> I mean, but we're always working. So if you hear a waterfall in the background, that's Don't mind it. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, give me that. We, yeah. we say on our team, like, crisis doesn't have nine to five hours. No, it Discharge doesn't. planners don't have Monday through Friday for the, there are discharges that happen on a Saturday night and we've got to get somebody into a facility. I mean, it's, you've got to be available. And if you're not, they're going to call someone else. They might get into the wrong hands. Exactly. And that's the thing is in my mind, they're going to call someone else. It's kind of like a plumber. Oh, there's it's a list. True. They've been given a list by a referral source somewhere. And you're on that list for a reason. Answer your phone. Well, you know, I have to share this. Um, when I first started acapella, I always answer the phone. You know, I'm, I'm just, it's just me. I'm, I'm just, I just want to succeed. And anyway, there was a political candidate that has given millions of dollars to several of the hospitals in town. 
um, when he was discharging from the hospital, his daughter that he gave millions to, his daughter was given a list of agencies and five o'clock on Friday. And we were the eighth on the list and I was the only one that answered the phone. There you go. And so it just showed it was like five oh five on a Friday. Yep. And I and that was a great, great client for us. We took care of him for many <clears throat> years. You know, people always say, oh, I don't answer my phone if it's an unknown caller. Well, mm -hmm. that's our world. Uh, so I imagine know. every call every gets number answered. Is, every number is, is unknown. unknown. Right. Well, and it stresses me out if I'm on the phone with a client and somebody's calling and I don't know who it is. Oh, cold then sweats. I'm like, okay. Oh, I'll... yeah, immediately. I'm like, <laughs> no. I can end this call. Yeah, <laughs> no, I want the next one. But then, this yeah, I want to help everybody. You're yeah. the best in the business. Well, so We love what we do. Yeah, yeah, and that that's the difference. And you can tell, you know, that you love what you do and you have passion and um, so I thank you so much. Y'all have been awesome guests. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, And Joe. I want to do one more guys. shout out. Um, you've both helped. We talked about the Medicaid nursing homes and those people have so little. Um, we do have a, a pajama drive coming up for That's Grandparents right. yes. Day, yes. September the 13th. And I know both of your companies have helped with us with pajamas. And thank you so much. Um, if somebody wants to be able to help these people in need, just donating new pajamas is wonderful. It's a community effort that we do. And I've had calls from other states. People want to do the pajamas for seniors, which is so yeah. exciting. We've got Girl Scouts involved and um, different organizations. So there's always a way to make a difference. You do you know, have a website or somewhere? We do. It's pajamasforseniors.org or info at pajamasforseniors. Um, and are you still doing drop off at your office? We're still doing we're drop still off. Doing dro you're welcome I usually to drop do the, the Fort Worth location. Yeah, yeah and we do in Fort Worth too. Mm -hmm. So um, if, you, if, if you're listening to this and want to help and just hear the needs of these seniors, um, any of us are a great resource for those and we'll get them into the right hands. Every pair of PJs yeah. matters. It, yeah, it, does. So, yeah. it, does. Yeah, it does. It does. So thank you so much. Have a great fourth. Thank you. Um, you be too. blessed and stay safe and stay healthy. Got it. So thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> we got them. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for having you. us.